Stop. Stop it. Oh, no, no, no. Did you stop it? Not yet. No, believe it. <laughs> You're only going to see the back of the hands anyway. Come on, children. Praise God. Amen. 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 Look at this. I talked to Preston a little earlier. Preston, you can go get You can stay down there, Preston. I talked to Preston a little earlier, unless you want to come up here and preach. <laughs> I talked to Preston a little earlier, and I said the last time I talked to Preston, Preston, you were about his size, and maybe a little smaller than that. Well, Preston's gotten tall now. Amen. God bless you. We love you all. Stretch your hands for it, Dad. Okay. You all want to dance? You all want to dance? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, if I take a vote, <laughs> okay, come on. We, you know what? I'm, I'm going to rule. Majority rules. <laughs> like the parliamentarian. You only got two votes. Yep, they carry. Uh, but yes. <laughs> all right. You, now, Preston, this may be new to you, but, but you're going to enjoy this. I guarantee you. You're going to enjoy this. You can, you can show your cousin. To do it. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. Samuel, what about you? You gonna help me out here? Okay. And then you want to move over the floor just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just bring that up.
Father, we love these children, and we know you love them best. And Lord, we, we so want the very best for them in life. Oh, God. There's so many forces out there that have a different plan for them than yours. But Lord, their parents and we in this church are fighting, Lord, the good fight of faith to make sure that the life they have is the life that you plan for them. Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that you may be glorified. You said the children of the upright shall be mighty in the earth. And Lord, that's what we want for them, to be mighty in the earth for you. So Lord, bless their parents as they seek to bring them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bless the teachers who seek to confirm and, and, and solidify all that the parents are trying to instill in them. And Lord, bless us as a church to continue to minister to children and young people. Because Lord God, the hour is so critical for that more now perhaps than it's ever been when the culture was not so hostile to the values that they need. Help us, Lord God, to take a firm stand, not only for us, but for them, for future generations. So we commit them into your loving care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Whoa. Slay the spirit up. <laughs> all right. God bless you all. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. I'll tell you, my children keep you young. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. We're rolling, right? Well, we want to say hello to all of our Facebook followers. God bless all of you. Thank you for tuning in. And we hope that these messages are helping you. And please get in touch with us at thecall.org if you want to communicate with us or you want to Join yourself to our ministry in some way. We're certainly glad to have you with us. By the way, everybody, we're going to start a television program um, somewhere around the middle of September. Uh, we're going to be going on television. Amen. And we're, we're believing God to work that out. We're, we're you saw, see that we moved one screen. We're getting ready to get the background behind me better set up for television and have some lights put up and, and all of that that we think will serve us better uh, for television purposes. But, well, we believe in God to continue to increase our audience, and so you all watching on Facebook are the beginning of that, but, but we hope that, um, that that's going to expand to many, many more to come. Uh, all right. We're in a series, and this gets a little bit complicated, but, but we're really in a series about the, the mission and vision of our ministry, and there are three parts to the mission, save souls, save families, save the nation, and I've been skipping around a little bit because I've gone into save families, but then I've come back to save the nation for a couple of messages that God put on my heart that he told me things I really needed to preach, really needed to say. And, and of course, the key scripture, and I'm using the old King James Version in this case, is Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. Now, we learned the last time that vision is essential to life. I mean, what the scripture says is where there is no vision, the people perish. That means that without vision, there is no life. Without vision, there is no progress. Without vision, there is no forward movement. And, and that, by the way, interestingly, includes us as human beings. Without God's vision, we would not exist. We are the product of the vision of Almighty God, who had you in mind and me in mind before the foundation of the world. I said we've been considerably flawed by the existence of sin, but nevertheless, God had a perfect vision of who we are and who we would be. And by the way, that vision is going to be fulfilled. God's initial vision for who you are, in spite of the entrance of sin into the universe, is going to be fulfilled. And it will be fulfilled in the resurrection when you and I will be absolutely perfect beyond where sin and death can ever touch us again. But we began with a vi as a vision in the mind or heart of God. Genesis 1, 26 says, God said, let us make man in our image, or let us make man in our vision, or according to our vision, or according to the picture that I have of who he or who she should be. Uh, in our image, according to our likeness. Uh, I'm going to make this creature like me. 
He's going to be like me. Amen? Amen. 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 So now human vision then is understanding what the will of God is through his word, logos, logos, and walking that out as you get revelation in the specific circumstances of your life, which is rhema. You know, there are two words in the Greek New Testament for the word. One is logos, which refers to the general revealed word of God. John 1, in the beginning, was the logos, and the logos was God. And then you find in other scriptures where God gives a rhema, R-H-E-M-A, a rhema, that's a specific word in a specific situation, often to a specific person. And so your rhema grows out of the logos, but the rhema is unique to you, okay? In other words, what God has for you, what he says, I want you to do, is not, that's a rhema for you. That's not a rhema for me. It's a rhema for you, amen? Amen. Amen. As you as you get that rhema, then you walk out the vision that God has for you as it's revealed in the specific circumstances of your life. And some of us, we end up in places we never anticipated perhaps we would we would end up. Brother Bob Creekmore has been involved in prison ministry. I probably was a time in his life, and he never thought he'd be doing that. But that was the vision that God had for him. And so, and the other thing I said last time is that that insight, that revelation of God for us begins with character. It begins with who God shapes us to be on the inside. What you end up fulfilling in life is a product of who you are, not the other way around. I mean, you, you are not who you are because of what you do. You do what you do because of who you are. See, and I, I use that example with God. I said, when God, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, the earth was without form and void, tohu abohu. In other words, it was, it was dark, and it was desolate, and it was chaotic. It says, and then God said, let there be light. Well, I said, what God spoke was what was in him. What God saw was what was in him. Because the word of God says that in him is light and no darkness at all. That's the first John 1 5. No light, I mean, in him is light and no darkness at all. So when God looked upon the darkness and looked upon the chaos, what he imposed upon that was his own character. See, so your vision for your light ultimately grows out of the character down on the inside of you. I said, my father didn't tell me, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a businessman, be a this, be a that. But, but what my father did for me was to help me develop a character that would allow me to do something with the skills and abilities that God gave me. Amen? Amen. 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 We, we spend a lot more time in our culture focused on people's skills and ability and very little time focusing on their character. And you know, skill and ability and talent and gifts will take you up, and bad character will bring you crashing right back down. How many times have we seen that happen? Amen? Amen. 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 So that, that's, that's vision. I wanted to lay that groundwork because I think that's important not only to us as a country, it's important to you as an individual. Lord, help me to understand your vision for my life. Help me to understand who you made me to be. And then out of that grows what God has for me to do. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. So now we come back to this issue of, of which I began to raise last time but didn't get too deep into. Is America a nation founded on a vision? Is America a nation founded on a vision? And the answer, in my view, is categorically yes. And, and, and I want to give you five principles today that undergird American society, which explain why we have been the most successful nation in the history of mankind. Yeah. I mean, the myth that the left uh, presents is, America was built on slavery. Well, that's not true. <laughs> did slavery exist in America? Of course it did. Of course it did. But remember, America, I mean, slavery primarily busters the agrarian 
culture of the South. See, while the North was industrializing, the South was falling further behind. And, and here again, America's 4% of the population, and we were responsible, depending on what year, 50 to 60% of the patents and inventions in, in the world. And we're 4% of the population. That, that has nothing to do with slavery. They don't have to do with freedom. Freedom. George Washington Carver uh, was, was a black man who, he was free, I think he was born in slavery, but he was free, educated himself, and, and became the most prolific, uh, really agrarian genius in the country. But he was responsible for helping the South do better with their crop growth because he did experiments. I mean, he, the man was, uh, he was a scientific genius. And of course, became wanted and needed by people of all kinds of backgrounds. Why? Because he had the freedom to explore his gifts and talents and abilities. And so he says, his testament is, his laboratory was God. So he would go out into his garden and talk to God. He said that God would give him insights and show him things. And those things would be translated. This man found 300 different uses of the peanut. 300 different uses of the peanut. Not, and and that's, that's just part of it. So, so my point is, yes, slavery was a reality. But this idea that somehow America's illegitimate because everything America's got is built on slavery. Well, that's just not true. I mean, it's just not true. Remember, most of the North had long since rejected slavery. And that's where the industrialization began. And that's where the inventions began. And that's where you know this, this sort of move toward industrialization. In fact, as I've said before, while the Civil War was definitely a war about slavery, and you can't get away from that. That was a major part of the issue. It wasn't only about that. So it was a clash of really two cultures that were moving in different directions. And, and, and that, that ultimately, that difference had to be resolved. Well, one of those directions was that the North was becoming an industrial culture. Mm -hmm. And the South was remaining an agrarian culture. I mean, that produces two different ways of thinking and approaching life and, and, and all of that. So, so while slavery was certainly a critical part of the Civil War, probably the major aspect that precipitated the Civil War, I'm saying it wasn't the only factor involved, and we do that history of the service to treat it as if it were. It is, as always in history, it's more complicated than the demagogues like to make it. Amen? Amen. 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 So what was the vision that America began with? The first principle of America's founding is faith. And by the way, let's be really clear. It was faith in the God of the Bible. Uh, and I, I'm going to get to something in a second. Let me not get ahead of myself. I think I may have shared this with you last time, but it's worth repeating. The Mayflower Compact, those who came over on the Mayflower Compact, com, com, on the Mayflower, and they signed the Mayflower Compact. Well, part of the wording of the Mayflower Compact, this agreement that they all entered into, said, in the name of God, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Now, they're tearing down statues of Columbus, and here again, Columbus was a flawed man too. But they're tearing down statues of Columbus, and Columbus came here believing that God had sent him on this exploratory journey, that he was doing it for God, and he was doing it to further the Christian faith. That's why the first island he landed on, he called San Salvador, Holy Savior. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He could have called it Columbus land, but he didn't. And see, part of what certain forces in this country want to do is disconnect us from that Christian history. Because if you can disconnect us from Christian history, then you can, you can turn everything into race and class division and warfare. But if you ever acknowledge the fact that the driving motivation behind much of what brought America to being into being was Christian, then all Christians of every background have something to relate to. Amen. 
Regardless of where they come from, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their background, they can relate to the fact that a fellow Christian, because if in fact Columbus was a Christian, I believe, having read a lot about him, I believe that the man was a Christian. You read his diary, and he talks a lot there about Jesus Christ and, and about what God has done for him. Uh, and you all probably know this, but they almost failed in that journey to land on in North America. They almost failed, and, and almost he faced a, a near mutiny to turn back. Because they were starving, they were sick, there were all kinds of problems on his ships. But he, he, he just believed that God had a plan for him, and lo and behold, just before everything went sour, they spotted land. He saw that as a sign from Almighty God and God's blessing on his journey. So now, did everything he do, was everything he did right? No. Is everything you've done right? You don't have to answer that question. I already know the answer. <laughs> Amen. So was he a flawed human being? Yes. Yes, he was. So, so by the time the Mayflower lands, they are coming in the name of God to advance the Christian faith. And remember, sailing to America was not like what we do today. You know, and if any of you have been on a cruise, I mean, you know, short of some of the problems we've had here recently, but people get on a cruise, I mean, it's just a good time. <laughs> you know, you, man, you're eating, and, and you know, I, I, I was just thinking the other day about the last time uh, my wife and I went on a cruise, uh, I spent a lot of time on the treadmill, looking out at the ocean, running. I felt like I was running on the ocean. That's not how it was on the Mayflower. <laughs> I mean, it was a dangerous journey. Remember, and they knew, too, that that most of the people at the Jamestown settlement had died. Most of them who came over here had died. And here's what they said about going anyway. They said, we verily believe and trust the Lord is with us and that he will graciously prosper our endeavors according to the simplicity of our hearts therein. These were Christian people for the most part. And they came here understanding themselves to be on a Christian mission. The first charter of Virginia. They said in their charter by the providence of Almighty God, in propagating of Christian religion to such people as yet live ignorant of the true knowledge and worship of God. Now, the people of the day would say, well, that's culturally insensitive because who do you think you are to say that the Native Americans were living in ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God? As a Christian, it's true. <laughs> I mean, what do we send missionaries around the world for if that's not true? Because we wanted them to know Jesus Christ, Amen. And there are many people living around the world who didn't, and still don't, know Jesus Christ. So they saw it as their mission to spread the gospel. Now, they had other things in mind as well, but that was part of it. And, and here again, the fact that these things find their way into their writings tells you something about their mindset and about what they saw themselves as trying to achieve. Now Samuel Adams, uh, and I, could, I, I don't have time to go through this in the detail. I'd like to. Um, when I was out at uh, Andrew Womack Ministries, uh, we did a panel discussion, me, him, and, and David Barton. And uh, I, I, I sit down and listen to David Barton. David Barton's like an, excited, like an encyclopedia. And we joked about the fact that you give David Barton five minutes, it's likely to be an hour before he stops. Because he's got so, I mean, our history is so rich. And there's so much about it that we don't know. He's made a, a, a study of, of, of things about our history that most Americans will never come to know unless we transform the nature of our education so that Americans begin to understand the full history of our country rather than just the polemic that is trying to teach people to hate America. But Samuel Adams was a sign of the Declaration of Independence, one of those founding fathers that is not much talked about. Here's what he said in one of his many writings, quote, the right to freedom is the gift of Almighty God. The rights of the colonists as Christians, as Christians, may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which ought to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. That's what Samuel Adams, who was a key founding father in New England, uh, but was a key founding father, that's what he thought about the nature of our country, that it could be best understood by a study of the New Testament. Benjamin Rush, 
Preacher, another sign of the Declaration of Independence people don't talk much about. He was from Philadelphia. Here's what he said. Without virtue, there can be no liberty. We weigh so much. Listen to this. Here's Benjamin Rush. Almost 250 years ago, we waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them, we neglect the only means of establishing, perpetuating our government, that is, the universal education of our youth in the principles of Christianity by means of the Bible. Amen. For this divine book, above all others, favors that equality among mankind that respect for just laws. Now, I could go on and on with this, but I don't have time to do that. George Washington, his first Thanksgiving proclamation, it is the duty of all nations to honor the providence, to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and to humbly implore his favor and protection. That went out to the whole nation. He said, this is our first duty to acknowledge God. Ben Franklin, at the, in the Constitutional Convention, stood up, the, the longer I live, the more um, convinced I become of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if the sparrow cannot fall from the sky without his, not, without, without, without his notice, neither can an empire rise without his aid. He said, and when we read in the scriptures, Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. He said, I, believe, I firmly believe this. He said, I also believe that without his concurring aid, we will be no more successful in this building than they were in building the Tower of Babel. And here again, you can go on and on with this. The, saints, the, the, the reality is, that, oh, and by the way, part of the reason why you said, well, Bishop, that I mean, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? For years, for years, beginning really back in the middle of the 20th century, there was a concerted effort to convince Americans that our founders were not Christians, that most of them were deists, and that they were not interested in scripture, that they were not interested in church, that they didn't believe any of that. Well, that was a lie, but it was a lie intended to try to separate us from that Christian history. So the fact of the matter is, and don't ever forget this because this is the absolute truth, and then I'm going to explain what I mean by it so you're not in any way confused by this. America is a Christian country. Amen. We always have been. And we as Christians ought to commit to this idea, and we always will be, as far as we're concerned. Amen. So when I, well, Bishop, now wait a minute. How can that be? How can we be a Christian country? We don't have an official religion in our country. And that's good. I support that. I don't want there to be an official religion. Because whose is it going to be? Even if you say, well, Christianity is the official religion. Whose? Which denomination? Which interpretation of scripture? That's how you get. You don't want the government di dictating, here's what it means to be a Christian. Oh, no, wait a minute. Whoa. What, are we talking about Pentecostalism? <laughs> you got to listen. You, you got some Baptist brothers that won't even set foot, foot in, a, in a Pentecostal church. You got some Pentecostals who don't, don't think that, that Baptists and Methodists are even saved. So, so whose religion is it? You know, we, we don't want an official religion, and we don't have one. But here's what the left, the left does. They, here's what they do. They say, see, the founding fathers didn't want Christianity to be the official religion of America. They didn't want it to be an official religion because they did not want the state trying to control or dictate what people thought and what was in their own conscience. But culturally, we are a Christian country. Amen. I mean, think about this. Would you think of going to India right now, 98% Hindu, and saying, well, but India's not a Hindu country. Well, of course it is. And, and by the way, I think India's moved away from Hinduism as, as its official religion, whereas it, but, but Christians and, and, and others still face a lot of persecution if you're not Hindu. But culturally, India is a Hindu nation. Culturally, China, until communists came in, was a Buddhist nation. I mean, 
So culturally, America is a Christian nation. We're not Muslims, we're not Buddhists, we're not Hindus, and we're not atheists. 65% of Americans in polling still identify themselves as Christians. Now, of course, we can say, you know, boy, that guy, where, where are they? <coughs> where are they? Well, they identify as Christians, which means that they still identify themselves with the culture, predominant culture of our country. But you can see from, from the historical record that there's evidence of that, plenty of it. And here again, I could go on and on and on with this. Uh, but America is culturally a Christian nation. And you can distinguish that from the argument, which is what, what I'm accused of. Oh, you know, Bishop Jackson wants a theocracy. I don't. There is going to be one in, in God's eternal kingdom. And it's going to be ruled by a king. And his name is Jesus. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I don't want any king on earth because I don't trust anybody on earth with the power with which I trust Jesus. I trust Jesus with all power in his hands because he's absolutely perfect. Nobody else meets that bill. Amen? Amen. 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 And saints, it is precisely Christian doctrine that made the founding fathers, now please listen to this here closely, that made the founding fathers resist, because there were forces that wanted it, resist the effort to put concentrations of power in the hands of one person. Uh, James Madison um, uh, 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 wisely said one time, part of the reason for our system of government, he says, is that enlightened statesmen are not always at the helm. And that was being kind. What he was saying was sometimes wicked people can get power. So they created a system, that, now listen to this, they created a system in which even they as the founders did not have absolute power. Do you realize how unique that is in human history? That doesn't happen. People don't create systems that cause them to have to give up power. People generally create systems that allow them to keep it forever. There was no, no uh, generational handing off of power. In fact, there was a celebration when John Adams took over from George Washington. There was a celebration because the thought was, we did it. Peaceful transition of power. And it didn't go to George Washington's son. And it didn't go to somebody else standing in the wings with, with guns of the, of, the, of the military saying, I'm taking over. It happened very peacefully. And, 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 and John Adams then had to work out his own government and decide who he wanted to stay with him. I mean, that was unique in human history. Even King George was fascinated when George Washington walked away. He said, I I've never seen anything like this. This man had the power of the presidency of the United States in his hands, and he walked away from it. Because, of course, all King George knew about was people who did everything in their ability to hold on to every bit of power they had and to never give it up. Now, here again, while we're tearing down the statues of the founding fathers, somebody needs to start talking about that and thinking about that. Because of their foresight and selflessness, we don't live under a dictatorship. You can like Donald Trump, you can hate Donald Trump, you can like Barack Obama or hate him, you can like Bill Clinton or hate him, you can like George Bush or hate him, you can like Ronald Reagan or hate him, you can like, you pick the, pick the person, you can like him or hate him, and I know there are all these rumors floating around, but let me tell you something, either at the end of four years or eight years, they're moving on. Amen. And by the way, here's the beauty of our system. Even if there is a president in office that I like, at the end of eight years, I want him gone. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, but you like him. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I don't want to live in a country where one person has power that just perpetuates and perpetuates and perpetuates and perpetuates. That's how you end up in a dictatorship. Yep. Where you lose all your liberty. The Christian principle, the 
heart is deceitfully wicked above everything. Who can know it? That was the basis upon which the founding fathers said, nobody's going to have absolute power in this. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. Not even us. Not even us. The president will be checked by the Congress. The Congress will be checked by the Supreme Court. And all of us will be checked by the people. All right? Faith. First principle, faith. Second is family. You say, well, wow, that's, that's interesting. Why, why would you even bring that up? How, how important was that? Well, well, first of all, the, oh, the early settlers came as families. The pioneers pioneered out the West as families. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how things got done. Remember, we, we are so accustomed to the modern era. My children are scattered all over the country. I have one in Texas, one in Atlanta, one in Boston. We're here in Virginia. That wasn't the way it was in the early days of the country. We apparently stuck together, worked together, <laughs> built together, and did everything together because they needed all that, that mutual support of each other in order to deal with a very hostile environment. Amen. Family was the key. In fact, here again, if you read into the biographies of the founding fathers or any president or any prominent person uh, in American history, you will always read about their families. You'll read about where they came from. You'll read about who their fathers and mothers were. You'll read about their wives. I say, you know, George, George would not have been George Washington without Martha. Martha Washington was critical to George Washington's career. Because you know, George Washington was not born to wealth, but his wife was. And, 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 and George Washington got introduced to the elite of society because of his military service to Fairfax, after whom Fairfax County is named. He kind of took George Washington under his wing and brought him, you know, they, when people talk about the, 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 the founding fathers as elites. George Washington was not at the top of the society. He was kind of brought in, and then his military accomplishments kind of brought, got him a lot of credibility and cachet among those who really controlled, like Fairfax, who really controlled a lot of American society. I mean, Fairfax, for all practical purposes, ran Virginia. I mean, they were the wealthiest family uh, in Virginia. Well, Martha Washington came from that, she came from that kind of background. George Washington did not. This family kind of struggled, to tell you the truth. I mean, he had to constantly try to take care of his mother throughout her life. So family was critical to him. And, and of course, he didn't have any children biologically, so, so his adopted children, you, you, you'll, you'll read, if you read his biography, you'll read about them and his relationships with them and what he tried to do for them, how he tried to nurture and encourage them and so forth. Same with um, uh, John and Abigail Adams. John wouldn't have been John without Abigail. I mean, Abigail was, was politically astute. In fact, I think in some ways she was more astute than her husband. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of admiration for John Adams, but, you know, I think the Alien and Sedition Act was one of his big mistakes, you know, when he started trying to punish people for the things that they said. Contrary to everything people tried to tell him that, but he, you know, I mean, I, I, think, I think John Adams, forgive me for going into this, but this stuff is fascinating to me. You may say, well, Bishop, it doesn't fascinate me. So, but since I'm doing the talking, sorry. <laughs> but you know, you know, George Washington was probably about six foot one. I thought I heard your voice say, oh, I was looking for you. Uh, George Washington was probably about six foot one, six foot two. Well, John Adams was probably about five foot four. I, I think John Adams had a little guy complex. Forget it. I'm not talking about little guys. Now. But I mean, I really, I really think he had a little guy complex. He, you know, he didn't get along with Jefferson. Jefferson was another tall guy. And in fact, they reconciled before they died, but I mean, they really hated each other's guts for a long time. And, and, and John Adams, George Washington, after, after he was no longer president, he would come to an event or something in Washington, and people would just go, well, oh, there it is, George Washington. And John said, well, he ain't that much. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he, you know, he used to feel a lot, a lot of jealousy. Well, I think the thing, Abigail reined him in and helped soften him. You know, he only served one term. Uh, but reined him in and softened him and, and, and I think allowed him to ultimately, to help him at least, to ultimately become president. But uh, the point I'm making is, oh, my, my goodness, and, and Abraham and Mary Todd Lincoln, I mean, you know, they lost two children, one while he was president, and 
And, uh, you know, this woman was by his side every step of the way. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting to read these stories. And, and, you know, here's the other thing, folks. You know, these are just, the, the historical ignorance of the American people keeps them from understanding, or keeps a lot of people from understanding, they were just like you and me. They were just human beings. Uh, there, there's a great story about this very attractive woman who Abraham Lincoln was coming in, I think coming into Washington, D.C., um, you know, in a, in a procession, and this very, very attractive woman, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln was not part of this, she was at home, but this very, very attractive woman rode up beside him and, and followed him through the procession, you know. And um, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot said about it except that Mary Todd Lincoln heard about it. When she heard about it, she let Abraham and let her know, in the future, do not ride beside my husband. <laughs> you, know? you know, and Abraham Lincoln tried to calm her down. Said, "Well, I, I, I didn't ask her to ride. I, I didn't. I didn't make her ride." She said, "She said I know, but in the future, let her know not to." I, I said that simply to say these are human beings with all the same issues you and I have. And, and, and we need to, to see the, the tremendous virtues that they had that allowed them to be used by God in the way that they were used. But they were families. From the very beginning, America was a place where families worked together and strove together and did things together. And, so, and frankly, I'm going to get into next week, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to start uh, probably a, a, a two-message series, a brief under-series on this a family uh, series entitled How to Raise Boys in an Anti-Masculine World. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because what has happened to families in our country, in my view, is largely the result of an assault on manhood. Mm -hmm. Now that's not the only factor, but I think that's the major factor, an assault on manhood, trying to make men ashamed of their manhood. You don't realize, just, just, just this one brief statistic, in 19, uh, I think it was 1960, might have been since then, but almost all the people who graduated from college, the majority of people who graduated from college, were men. You realize now that, that women are, I think, 69% of college graduates. Men, men have fallen way behind educationally. Um, men are falling behind in terms of their ability to earn an income. Uh, you know, we talk about the, the decimation of the black family. You realize that in 1960, uh, Americans of European descent, only 3% of children were born out of wedlock. Today is 36%, more than a third, and it's continuing to climb. So this is not just a problem in a certain ethnic communities. This is a problem across the board in our culture. And by the way, boys, I think, are suffering as a result of these dramatic changes far more than girls are. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Girls need their fathers, too. They need their daddies, too. But I'm convinced of this. Boys need their daddies even more. Mm -hmm. They really do. They really do. So, so we'll, we'll get into all of that. But, but my point is family was how our country functioned. Everything was pretty much done around the family. So that, that's it. So faith, family, third principle is this, freedom. Yep. Freedom. Amen. You know, th this idea that each individual is inherently sovereign and free before Almighty God. Inherently sovereign and free before Almighty God. Now let me just say a word about this, this ideology, that this the racial ideology that grew up. Now you may have heard me say this before, but, but even if I have, it's worth repeating. You all realize the concept of quote unquote white is something relatively new. That's not the way people thought of themselves. It, 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 that, that was created 
by elites and largely slaveholders in our country. Because remember, and here again, this is something you won't hear. Only 8% of the people in the South own slaves. You would think, based on history, every white man in America owns slaves. Only a small number of people did because they couldn't afford them. Boy, that, that's, that's going to shake up some historians, but a little amateur historians, because the picture you're given is, oh, and, and by the way, there were thousands, I think the number's 50,000, don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure it's 50,000 in the South, in the antebellum South, just before the Civil War, free blacks, many of them owned slaves. That's a story that you know people don't want to tell either. Um, but but what happened was the first when 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 the first blacks arrived in 1619, they were not intergenerational slaves. They were indentured servants. They were they were given a period of years to serve. Uh, that period was seven years. The most famous of those people is Anthony Johnson, uh, who was I think his original name was Antonio, but uh, changed his name to Anthony Johnson, Americanized his name. Um, every person was given, I think, 50,000 acres of, of land. Here again, don't hold me to the number, but they were given some percentage of acres of land uh, after they served their indentured servitude because, of course, they needed people to populate the land. They were trying to get people to work the land. Well, Anthony Johnson happened to be black, and he ended up with a, a, a plantation, about 250,000 acres um, in, uh, um, uh, on the eastern shore. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's about 250 acres on the eastern shore. And, um, and he, of course, he owned slaves. And one of the slaves that he owned, um, a guy by the name of, of Kesor, sued him to be freed from indentured servitude. And, and as a result of that, the, the, Anthony Johnson proving to the court that this guy tried to cheat him, the court bought it, and he was sentenced to lifetime servitude. Black man, lifetime servitude to a black man. In the early days, of course, when you got black people being free and getting land and working land and hiring indentured servants, and by the way, free blacks have white indentured servants working for them. Here mm -hmm. again, that's not a part of the history you'll hear. So, well, Mr. Whitman, how, how could that possibly be? Because this whole issue of white versus black was really created primarily by large landowners to control poor whites. Because what they did not want was for poor white people coming to America to ever realize they had more in common with indentured servants than they did with slave masters, with white slave masters. And, and this really came to the fore during Bacon's Rebellion, because. Uh, uh, Baker was the guy who started the rebellion in uh, 1641, I think, um, somewhere in there. And, and he recruited black, white, because basically what they were saying was that they were, their land was being treated differently than the land of the elite wealthy owners who made sure that their land was secure, but the smaller, less wealthy owners were ignored and often they were the they suffered the worst Indian attacks and all of that, and basically just had no recourse. And Nathaniel Baker said, uh-uh, enough of that. And he got a bunch of people together in what they call Baker's Rebellion, and they were mixed. They were of every racial background. Well, guess what the large landowners saw as a result of that? We can't have these white people and black people getting together. And that was the beginning of what you call racial ideology, where, well, wait a minute, whether you're Irish or Italian or, or Eastern European or whatever, no, no, you're white. Because you have to remember, in Europe, people saw their race not as their skin color, but as someone from a different nation. So if you were Irish, you viewed the British as a different race and vice versa. And you don't think, you don't, well, we're all white people. It was those British, or those Irish, or those Italians. And so when you get here, for example, when you have the large influxes of people from other countries, 
You don't have the Italians and the Irish beating each other here saying, well, you know, we're all white folks. Let's get together. They fought like dogs. And the Irish called, had nasty names for the Italians, and the Italians had nasty names for the Irish. And they fought. But the racial ideology was meant to say, well, now, wait, 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 wait. That's OK. But don't ever fight with the blacks. Don't ever side with them, because they're a different breed. I mean, you all are familiar with Othello, right? Why didn't William Shakespeare do a, a play about Othello saying, well, now, you know he was black, so he was oppressed, and he was downtrodden, and, and you know, nobody liked him. You know, there's no race in, in Othello, because people weren't thinking about that. It wasn't something they were caught up in. As, as I've explained before, when, when one people feels the need to oppress each other, they develop an ideology to justify that oppression. And that's true across all racial and cultural lines. It doesn't really matter what the background or skin color of people are. It's what they do. It's the sinful nature of human beings expressing itself. Amen? Amen. 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 That's why I, you all hear me. I prefer to use European Americans of European descent or Italian, or Irish, or, or Eastern European, or Ukrainian, or whatever it is, and, and Americans of African descent, or Americans of Asian descent, because we're, we, you know, we're, wherever we came from, we're all Americans now. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, the, look, actually, if Dr. King said this originally, I've adapted it, but you know, as preachers sometimes do, you know, they say, the first time you hear preachers say something, you repeat it, and you say, well, as, as Reverend Smith has always said, and then the next time you say it, as I've heard someone say, and then the third time you say it, as I always say it. So, <laughs> it's a little friendly, friendly plagiarism, but I think it was Dr. King who was the first one who said, you know, our ancestors may have come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we don't want to sink the boat. Amen? Because we sink the boat, guess what? We all go down in the boat. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, so anyway, all, all of that, believe it or not, was about freedom. <laughs> Psalm 119.45 says, I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. Isaiah 61.1, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim what? Liberty to the captives. Jeremiah 34.17, God says, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty, everyone to his brother and everyone to his neighbor. Galatians 5.1, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Galatians 5.13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. See, where, where did this concept of inherent human freedom come from? The word of God. They didn't conjure that up out of their own imaginations. They got it from the word of God, which says that God intended us to be free. Now, you all know that when the Constitution was ratified on September 17th, 1787, it did not have a Bill of Rights. The first 10 amendments we call the Bill of Rights. The first and second are the most famous, you know, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, and the second, the right to the, the, the freedom to bear arms. And by the way, this idea that, well, it's different now, and the founding fathers, if they had known what weapons they have now, they wouldn't have put that in there. That's silly. Because here's what the founding fathers understood. Governments can go awry. And that human beings should always be in the position to defend themselves. I mean, we've seen it on the local level, right? Where a city, if you happen to be a law-abiding citizen minding your business, like that couple was, and a mob comes on your property, there's no police there to defend them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and frankly, you know, they're, they're in trouble now for having brandished weapons. But if they hadn't brandished those weapons, they might have been dead by now. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure That's what held the mob at bay. Our founding fathers understood that ultimately your last line of defense for your safety is you. And that's what the Second Amendment's all about. It's not about hurting people. And it's true, we, we have a lot of guns in America because this is a frontier culture. And you weren't going out west. I mean, when you, anybody pioneering the west, you, you made sure that you had food and water and clothing and a gun. You better have something to protect yourself because there are bears out there. 
and there, there are natives out there who may or may not care for you, you've got to defend yourself and your family and your own life. And there was no sheriff to call. We were talking about this because a guy who gave me a ride this weekend um, is a cowboy. I mean, a real cowboy. He said, I wanted to be a cowboy since I was a, since I was a kid. He said, and I, I worked two newspaper routes to buy some cowboy boots and some dungarees and a cowboy hat. He said, and as soon as I got old enough, he said, I started rodeo. He said, actual guy rides, he doesn't do it anymore, but he used to ride bulls and, and ride bronking uh, buckos and all of that. And, and we were talking about the fact that, you know, in the West, before there was law and order established, people were their own law and order. And I said, you know, you steal cattle on a horse, you're going to get hung. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that was right. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that, you know, whoever you stole it from, they caught you. They were going to deal with you themselves. There was no sheriff to call. Uh, I, I said that simply to say, when you're pioneering a wild country, it creates a certain culture that requires that people be capable of defending their own lives and the lives of their families. That's still very much a part of our culture. You know, believe it or not, I, I, I probably never said this to you before, but you know, particularly in the city, says we know we got to get around on the subways, we got to get around on the buses, we you know we got to do away with all these cars. Mm -hmm. You know what I've often said? Cars are like America's horses. Yep. Yep. I want to have my own. Exactly. Don't take you. You're not taking my horse. <laughs> no. And you can't separate men from their cars. Uh-uh. No. There's no way. No. Amen. But but look, the Bill of Rights was hotly debated. And, and initially John James Adams, uh, James, uh, James Madison called the father of the Constitution, was against it. And here's why he was against it. He said, because if you if you name the rights, you are implying that that's all there are. He said, and the fundamental rights that God gives should never be limited to a simple list. Ultimately, he came around and realized, I, I think the better argument was, no, we need a Bill of Rights because there's certain things that are so fundamental that you simply need to set them forth. Yeah. And of course, a couple of years later, the Bill of Rights was passed and became part of the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, can I just use this as a footnote to say, this freedom and these fundamental rights, they believe, were given by God. And the Supreme Court has now taken upon itself to expand what I believe the fundamental rights are that God gave us and created what I call think rights that the Supreme Court gives us. Mm -hmm. yep. So see, the right to an abortion is a fake right. Yep. right. That's not a fundamental right God gives anybody. Yo, God gave you the right to kill your baby. No. no, no. That's, that's a fake right. The, the, the right to a same-sex marriage is a fake right given by the Supreme Court. That's not a fundamental right that God gave. Amen. 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 God didn't give that as a fundamental right. Amen. Amen. The founding fathers understood that fundamental rights inherent to who we are as human beings are the right to freedom of conscience, the right to speak, the right to travel, to, to govern my own affairs, the right to privacy, to be secure in my pro property, in my persons. You know, there, there are certain fundamental rights inherent to who I am as a human being. You start spinning out all these other rights, and guess what you need? Government to control people to make sure that they're enforced. And that's exactly what the founding fathers did not want. Principle number four, I'm running a little late, but let me get big. Through this quickly. Principle number four, which is probably something you don't expect me to say and it's forgotten, but principle number four was virtue. Mm -hmm. The Valley Fathers believed that you couldn't have freedom without moral virtue. Yeah. They said, well, Bishop, how virtuous could they be? I mean, after all, this is what's always brought up. They had slavery. Well, how virtuous are we? I mean, how many of you as Christians have ever, as you've grown in your Christian walk, realized that you've had blind spots? You know what I mean by blind spots? In other words, you're a Christian, you love the Lord, you want to do what's right, but you realize one day, you know what, that attitude or that, that approach and that, you know, that, 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 that wasn't, that, well, that's not really consistent with who God wants me to be. And you didn't really think about it in Christian terms, Sometimes it takes maturity and growth and revelation, which is what happened to the Valley Fathers, by the way. They grew in their understanding of, 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 the, of the, the inherent evil of slavery and for the most part came to condemn it. The only states that remained pretty recalcitrant, both in the Declaration and the Constitution, 
were Georgia and North Carolina. South Carolina, sorry. Sorry, North Carolinas. South Carolina and Georgia. They were hardcore, okay? But, the, but think about this. When the nation was formed, 11 of the 13 colonies wanted to include a denunciation and an outlawing of slavery. How often do you hear that? Yeah. 11 out of 13. So, well, Bishop, then why did they do it? Because they knew to fight Great Britain, they needed everybody. And they compromised. And so what they did was they put it off. And they kept putting it off. And they kept putting it off. And until ultimately there was a civil war, you couldn't put it off anymore. But look, this idea, understand something. The moral conscience of this nation caused slavery to be a matter of debate from the moment it started. Yeah, yeah. There's never a moment in American history when slavery is not hotly debated. Where there are not voices saying, this is wrong. It's inconsistent with who we are. Well, if we're such a racist nation, why are there voices speaking against it? But you don't hear about that. Because there's a narrative that people want you to believe. America's bad, America's evil, America's no good. America's always oppressed black people. What about all the good, decent people who have done so much to try to help obtain liberty for every American? Amen. Do you know almost a third of those lynched by the Ku Klux Klan during the lynching period were white people? Who dared stand up for the rights of black folks? What about them? Why don't they count? Why, does it, why isn't that an expression of America? By the way, I just to get it in here, it was a Democrat who literally, almost single-handedly, resurrected the Ku Klux Klan by the name of Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. Recommended the nation pay attention to this heroic group and watch their movie, Birth of a Nation. Yep. And it was a Republican by the name of Ulysses Grant that decimated the Ku Klux Klan, outlawed it, passed laws to outlaw it, outlaw it, and used the army to stop them and put many of them in prison. Amen. Amen. Won't hear that in part of our history either. I don't say that to, to laud Republicans and condemn Democrats. I just say it to show our history is not the narrative that people want to paint it to be. Uh, well, you know, everybody's been always against any kind of equality, any kind of freedom for certain people in this country. It's just not true. Amen. And, and, and we need to teach our children the truth about our country Amen. so they can have hope Amen. instead of feeling like they're living in a nation of despair Amen. where there's no hope for them. Because all the forces are against them. Look, John Adams said our Constitution was made for moral and religious people. George Washington said of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion, and morality are indispensable supports. And by the way, he gave... He, some notes he gave, didn't use this in his, um, his farewell address, but he talked about the danger, the greatest danger to the country, he said, was moral corruption and overwhelming ambition. In other words, people want power so much that they'll do anything to get it and keep it. Thomas Jefferson in notes on Virginia, Thomas Jefferson, again, pulling his statues down, here's what Thomas Jefferson said, he said, can the liberties of the nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis of conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God? They are not to be violated but with his wrath. And he's talking about slavery here now. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever, and that supernatural interference may become probable, for the Almighty cannot side with slavery. Fifth principle, truth. Truth. Jesus said, you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Our founding father said, we hold these, not opinions, but truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by our creator. And now we're living in an age where people are telling us there is no truth. That's just your truth and my truth. And you know, you hear people on television talking about this, they say, well, that was her truth. And it could be some of the dumbest stuff you ever heard. But that was his truth. No, there's the truth. Amen? Amen. It's just, I mean, 
what, what dummy would go up on top of a building and say, well, you know what, it's my truth, it definitely doesn't work, and jump. It works, it's the truth, and you're gonna go splat. And the fact of the matter is, American culture is not perfect, but here again, this idea that, well, you know, cultural relativism and no culture is better than another, really? Go down here to some of these aboriginal cultures in South America and Africa, some of them, I, I hope it's ended now, but in recent years, still hit, still hit honey. Wow. Mm. Still cutting people's heads off and shrinking them. Mm -hmm. as, as, to use some kind of talisman or power over your enemy. Go to Haiti and see how much voodoo they're practicing there. I mean, you go all over the world and see all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, some of this weird stuff coming out of China because of pagan culture. Look, a culture based upon Christianity is going to be better than a culture based upon paganism. That's right. It is just that plain and simple Amen. because one is rooted and grounded in truth and the other is rooted and grounded in falsehood. And if blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, then cursed is the nation whose God is not. Amen? Amen. All right, let me take, take the last few moments to say, okay, what do we do, Bishop? That if, if those are the foundations how, and, and they're being eroded, how do we get them back? How do we bring them back? Psalm 11, 3 says that the foundations be destroyed. What shall the righteous do? So, Bishop, what, what, what are we as Christians supposed to do? Here's number one. Number one, we've got to stand up for what I just told you. Black. White, Hispanic, however you want to designate it, Americans of African descent, European descent, Irish, Italian, uh, uh, Eastern European, Russian, Asian, Indian, whatever our backgrounds, we got to stand up for the fact that this is a Christian nation. All right. Amen. And we've got to not be ashamed to assert that. And then begin to ask the question, is what I'm looking at, is that an expression of those Christian values? Well, well, maybe, oh, then, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm, that's not good for us then. Okay? Is this is this movement an expression of our Christian values? Oh, well, no. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm not. No. We are a Christian nation. That is the foundation of our nation. When we move away from that, we move away from our future. We move away from our prosperity. We move away from our well-being as a nation. We move away from our ability to unify as a nation. Because if, 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 a person's identity is in their skin color. That's who they are. That automatically says they're divided from everybody else. Yeah, that's true. I mean, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that's what we're going to base the nation on, then we're looking, folks, we're looking for some bad times. Mm -hmm. We say the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all because until we're one nation under God, there's not going to be any indivisibility, unity. There's not going to be any liberty and justice for all because what you're going to have is everybody fighting for their little piece of the pie mm -hmm. and fighting for the crumbs mm -hmm. that the government dispenses to us all. Mm -hmm. So we've got, to, we've got to assert that without apology. Mm -hmm. And I know that the separation of church and state people go crazy when they hear me say it. But it's still the truth, and it's, it's a cultural truth. I'm not saying oh, it's a legal, institutional truth. It's a cultural truth about the nature of our country. Amen? Amen. 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 The preamble to the Constitution says this, we the people. That's the other thing we've got to assert, that the ultimate sovereignty of this nation is in us, not in politicians. It's in us. Yeah. And I think, you know, the the the... the ease with which people started obeying and complying with the orders that were being given by governors and mayors, let me know that people don't understand this. That the Constitution's preamble begins with we the people, not we the politicians, not we the elites, not we the corporate leaders, but we the people. And it says, look at this, in order to form a more perfect union. And you know, that in itself ought to tell you something that they knew it wasn't perfect. But they said, but we want it to become perfect. We want to keep striving toward that. And they said, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, look at this, secure the blessings of liberty. Amen. We've got to come back to this Constitution. Yep. We've got to come back to the values that it enunciates. 
Look, and, and, and I love this language, which is seldom pointed to, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. You know, to ordain means to set something apart or someone apart for a sacred purpose. They said, we ordain this Constitution. You know what that tells me? They saw this as an expression of the will of God for the future of this nation. We ordain this Constitution, amen? amen? And look, so I say, here's what they were saying in my words. We the people by this sacred covenant, the Constitution of the United States, the sacred covenant, are hereby securing the blessings of liberty given to us by Almighty God. Now the thing is, saints, is there anywhere in there that says that preamble, that constitution, does not apply to certain people? So the issue is not whether the document is good. Frederick Douglass said it was good. Martin Luther King said it was good. The issue is how accurately and diligently and vigilantly do we apply it? Amen. You know, when Dr. King stood on the steps of the, of the, of the Lincoln Memorial, he said, we have come to, to, to our nation's capital to cash a check. That when the founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, they were writing a check to which every American would fall heir. How different is that than we need to tear the whole thing down? How different is that? How, how we let those majestic words for this nonsense that we're hearing, no, the system needs to be brought down. And you know what he also said that we forget? He said, I have a dream. He said, and it is a uniquely American dream. Do you remember that? He didn't say it's a dream that can't be fulfilled in America. He said, it's an American dream. In other words, it expresses the very best that this nation claims to represent. That my four little children will one day be judged by the content of their character not by the color of their skin. See, that's what it means to be a nation of individual liberty. See, where the individual matters. Do you realize in China, in India, in other places of the world, individuals don't matter? Only the collective matters, which is why communism has killed 100 million people, because the individual doesn't matter. It's only the collective that matters. So if you have to kill a few thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions in order to affect this utopia, that's okay. You know what the American principle of, 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 of our criminal justice system is? Here again, I know it's flawed. I know it's, it's make, it can make mistakes. But you know, as, a, as somebody who practices law, do you know what the, 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 the guiding principle of our criminal justice system is? And we've forgotten it. We would rather let the guilty go free than convict the innocent. How often do you hear that today? That's a guiding principle of our criminal justice system. But you, here again, this nation that people are being taught to hate, what we've got to do is come back to these principles upon which this nation was built, as Dr. King called us to do, because therein lies the hope for our future. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The word of God says when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. The word of God says blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Saints, we have not prospered as a nation because we've been perfect. If that, were the, if that were the basis, we shouldn't exist anymore. We have prospered as a nation not because we've been the most exploited nation and we've been the most horrible nation and we've mistreated Native Americans and we've mistreated Black Americans. All. No, it's because we've been a nation of faith. And just like for you and me, God has looked beyond our faults and seen our needs. That's what you wanted to do for you and me. How many of you want God to say, Lord, don't, don't, don't look at what I'm trying to do. Don't look at my highest aspirations. Just look at all the wrong stuff I've done and respond to me like that. And yet that's what some people want for America. Lord, don't look at any good thing. Don't look at the fact that we beat back the vicious Nazis who would have turned the whole world on slaves. Don't 
look at the fact that we've tried to do right. We've acknowledged the wrongs done to our citizens of African descent, acknowledge the wrongs of slavery, and we're trying to correct that. No, 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 don't look at that, Lord. Just look at the wrong stuff what we've done and condemn us. Is that how you want God to treat you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not me. Amen. You can have that kind of justice if you want it, but I want some mercy. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, American history teaches these foundational principles that we were studying, right? And American history should be the context for understanding who we are, and instead, the left is used it as a pretext for condemning who we are. American history should be a moral platform for building a more virtuous and victorious nation, and the left uses it as a mud pit for wallowing in the past mistakes of our nation. According to the left and their political arm, the Democrat Party, American history is the story of evil people, particularly white people. Because, you know, evil has a race. <laughs> yeah, I know I said it, I mean it, because that's how absurd it is. That's how absurd it is. That's how wicked and twisted and evil it is. Evil has a race, according to the left, and it's white people, particularly white men. Every Christian ought to hear that ought to make your maybe ought to make your godly blood boil. Because you know what the word of God teaches. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And why is that so different than the wrong stuff that was done by Africans to Africans and Asians to Asians, and Europeans to Europeans? It's no different, it's just sin running its course. But only one nation establish itself on the principle that God is the one who gives us freedom. Amen. And God is the one who gives us rights. And our children in most of our public schools and colleges and universities are not being taught American history, but they're being given anti-American propaganda. Yes. Amen. Tim Kaine recently said, America didn't inherit slavery, we created it. Now I want to know, are you just that dumb? Or are you that much of a demagogue? And you're a U.S. Senator, do you hate the country that much that you want to propagate a lie so that people will hate it like you do? I mean, it's bizarre. You can't justify that by, oh, well, you know, but America created this and America created... Folks, let me tell you something, and here again, only I, as a descendant of slaves, can say this, uh, with, and even people get mad at me for saying this. American slavery wasn't anything near as bad as South America was. Oh, yeah. It wasn't anywhere near as bad. South America was more like a factory mindset. And, 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 and because the, the, one of the first stops was South America, um, and, and again, because America only got somewhere between 2.5 and 5% of the 12 million Africans who left Africa. Those of you who are descendants of slaves in this room, as I am, you're part of a very, 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 very small percentage of people whose ancestors actually left the African continent and came to North America. Most didn't. 95 to 98 percent of the people ended up South America, Caribbeans, and Europe, not America. But South America, what I've read about, it was horrific. If you, if you fell down and died, you bring another one. Whereas in America, because of the, the cost of slavery, and, and, and wasn't always compassion, I'm not trying to spin this into something that it wasn't, it wasn't always compassion, but every slave was valuable. You didn't want them to die. You didn't want them to be sick. Because they were worth something to you. Now, here again, that's, it's in a, in a messed up system, but nevertheless, it wasn't nearly as bad here as it was in other parts of the world. Now, now I, 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 here again, I would say that to justify slavery, it was evil and it was wrong. I say that merely to say, why is it that you want to act like, a, a U.S. Senator wants to act like America? Nested, nested. I mean, America created the system. America is the culprit. 
It's a lion spit out of the pit of hell. Amen. Listen, America's not an evil nation that's been lucky. America's a good nation that's been flawed and been blessed by Almighty God because we put our faith in Him. Okay? Amen. Amen. He didn't say blessed is a nation who's perfect. He said blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 So look, saints, if we want to build a future for our country, because that's what it's all, this is all about, having a vision for America, it can't be based upon the mess that we're seeing going on around us now. It can't be based on this segregating ourselves into our little balkanized groups and fighting with each other over microaggressions. I mean, I had no idea. I just found out not too long ago to ask somebody where they're from is racist. I thought it was just showing an interest in them. You know, all these, these little microaggressions now that you know, you're walking on eggs. I gotta make sure I don't say anything that's wrong to keep us divided, keep us tense, keep us bitter, keep us angry, keep giving, keep giving us a reason to be all upset. And by the way, you know who that bitterness erodes? The person who possesses it. Yeah. Amen. Glory to God. We're teaching our children to be victims. All women are victims. You know, on August 18th, we'll celebrate 100 years since women had the right to vote. So women have only had the right to vote 100 years. I don't hear anybody talk about that, but you know, they said, well, they, they weren't including black people. They weren't including women either. Because uh -huh. women were simply considered an attachment to their husbands. They didn't have any property rights. Yep. Amen? Amen. Amen. If, a, if, a, if, a, if a father left property to his daughter, that property left to his daughter did not go to her husband. It went to whoever other heirs of her father there was. She could hold it temporarily, that's all. We weren't, we weren't a perfect union. You, you realize people don't, didn't own property, couldn't vote? That's true. Yep. Even if you were an American or European descent, if you didn't own property, you couldn't vote. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, it's, it's been a constant process of trying to, to work this thing of, of constitutional republic through to, to become, what, a more perfect union. But we can't build our future on hatred and victimization and, and the idea of everybody's oppressed and everybody's out to get it and look at all the wrong stuff that was done in the past. I mean, look, if, if, if I had to be held accountable for what my granddaddy and great-granddaddy did, because mm -hmm. I was told some horrific stories, mm -hmm. I don't want to be held accountable for them, mm -hmm. only for me. Mm -hmm. We can't keep holding America accountable for what happened 150 years ago when people were dead. I mean, we got to look to the future. What do we want our children to come up in? What kind of America do, they want to, do we want them to inherit? Amen. One of which they're constantly looking over their shoulder at their classmate of a different background or race. No, he's out to get me. He's, he's privileged over me. And forgive me, I don't mean to make this personal in any way. But when Oprah stands up in front of some poor white guy, a billionaire, talking about, well, you know, you got advantages <laughs> over you. <laughs> it's silly. Because wow. you know what he should have said? Well, I'll tell you what, let's trade places. I'll deal with your oppression. You can deal with my privilege. <laughs> Write the check right now. Right. <laughs> Amen. No, so we got we to gotta come together. Our vision has got to be the vision of, of us coming together. And we can't, look, we can't build our hope ultimately, not even on our Constitution, as a wonderful document that is, because we can see it can be corrupted by corrupt people. We can't build it on our economy. We learn that the economy can turn on a dime. I mean, wow! From full employment to suddenly, what was it, the top number? I think 30 million people out of work in a matter of weeks. And we can't build it on our military because, you know, we're living in a very dangerous world today. And we're, we've got people being taught now not to join the military, but to hate the military. Yeah. No, saints, we got to build our hope on the word of God. Amen. We got to build it on the love of God. 
You know, the Bible says, how can you say you love God and hate your brother? Yeah. I mean, what? And Christians buy into this stuff? How can we do that? And I, as I said before, when you get to heaven, again, right now, I live in a brown body. When I stand, when I drop this robe of flesh and stand before God, what am I going to stand before him as a black man? Or stand before him as a spirit? And, you look, and, and, and do you think God's going to say to me, son, were you down with the struggle? <laughs> hey, come on. We, we know what God is going to want to know of me. Were you faithful to what I called you to do? Did you love your neighbor? And Jesus, when he told the, the, the story about the Samaritan, you all forgive me, I'll write it a little long, but, but I need to say this. When he told the story about the Samaritan, that was a story about racism. It was a story about the Jews looking down on the Samaritans and Jesus saying, yeah, but when a Samaritan heals your wounds, puts you up for a couple weeks, takes care of you, is he your neighbor now? Mm -hmm. Come on. What he saying? Love doesn't have any ethnicity. We're supposed to love one another. You know, the love is about toleration. Toler no, it's not about tolerating, it's about loving. We're supposed to love one another. Amen? Amen. 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 Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Stand up on your feet. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, we are so grateful for what you've done for us today grateful for your word, grateful for your truth, grateful that you sent Jesus yes. to give us a new vision of life, yes. and Lord God, grateful for this nation in which we get to live in freedom, yes. and we pray that that freedom will never, ever be taken away because you gave it to us. Help us to defend it with every fiber of our being to fight the good fight of faith so that we pass on to our children regardless of what they quote unquote look like we pass on to them a nation of hope and faith and love and opportunity Lord how wonderful it would be to live in a nation where we look at each other as fellow Americans and care about each other because we share a common vision of who we are and what, what we want our country to be. And we want every one of our fellow citizens to experience the very best that the nation has to offer, to be able to take their God-given gifts and talents and abilities and go wherever it will take them. Where each of us looks at each other, not on the basis of what we quote-unquote look like, but on the basis of who we are on the inside. The character we bring, the talents we bring, the abilities we bring, the honor, the decency, the integrity that we bring. Father God, we, we're, we're, we're losing so many of our young children in our streets. We're losing them to false ideologies. We're losing them to false ways of, of seeing life and looking at life. We're losing them to dead end streets that can only lead to their destruction. And we want to save them. We want to save this nation means we want to save the next generation and generations yet to come. We want every American to realize we all bleed the same red blood. We want every American to realize that when they put on a uniform to defend this nation, it's the same uniform regardless of the color of the person's skin. We want Americans to realize, Lord God, that we live in the unique and only nation that establish itself on the principle that our rights and freedoms aren't given to us by government. They are the gift of Almighty God. And the role of our government is merely to secure those rights. That's all. To make sure that we all remain free. And that's all of us. And Lord God, we can't, it can't be all of us if we're dividing each other, slicing and dicing each other on the basis of skin color 
So Father God, save this nation, we pray. Because America, I really believe, Lord, is, is at the precipice. We can, we can disintegrate because we are so divided. And Lord, the divide really does seem to be primarily the godless versus the godly. Yeah. The one young man down in Orlando Magic who refused to kneel, all of his teammates, every single one of them, kneeled and while the flag and the anthem were playing, and this one young man stood up, and when they asked him why, he said, because I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer. Not disrespecting him, dishonoring the flag, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love of God. And he used it as an opportunity to bear witness to Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Lord God, help us to find ways to come together. We know the devil can always find ways to rip us apart. Help us to find ways to bring this nation together because we know that that's the only hope we have for the future. And we know that only you can. Now, Father God, dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Go with us, remain with us, be everywhere with good. We as your disciples confidently hope that all will be well when we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. May you be a blessing.